are you going with the gift buying? I'm curious, has, has anyone done all of their shopping yet? Anyone? A few. Louisa, Callum, wow. That is impressive. Has anyone done all of their gift wrapping? No. Ah, good, good. That's just to make all of us feel a little bit a little bit better. It's a little bit frantic, doesn't it? Well, I wanted to this morning just talk a little bit about rediscovering, of course, the one gift that cannot disappoint. Now we all know the answer to that. And we all know that it is Jesus, and we all know that we need to rediscover him um, at some level to some new depth each each Christmas. But how do we do that? How do we do that? One of the things about gift wrapping, and I, I happen to be the, the, the wrapper in our, our family. I mean, not the wrapper, but the wrapper. I happen to be the gift wrapper in our family. I just kind of get how, how it all folds and so forth. And, and one thing that I know is that um, when you've got a really special gift, not, not the stocking fillers, don't worry about the stocking, when you've got, when you've got a really special gift, you want to wrap it nicely, don't you? That's when you sort of look at the different papers that you've got. You've got some left over from last year. I've got those crinkly ones which were on special, and now you realise why. And then you've got actually some nicer rolls of paper there as well. A little bit of gold colouring in them. And, and when you've got a special gift, I don't know about you, but that's the one I go for. I kind of feel like, well, this gift needs to be wrapped very, 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 very nicely. It's a special gift. It's going to have special wrapping. And, and so it is often, I think, with a special message. If you have a special message for someone, you don't use a kind of a common, a common sort of a format to, to offer. You don't text someone, I love you, will you marry me? I mean, generally speaking, you don't, do you? If you're going to propose to someone, you're, you'll probably actually go to, go to some sort of elaborate sort of deal. I remember Bron and I were sort of, um, I just had a loss of confidence when we were choosing um, our engagement ring and I really kind of, Bron had very specific tastes and so we actually shopped for it together. And I remember standing outside the shop, we had it and, and there was no surprise, there was no way of hiding it. I, I know people who do this while parachuting and things like this, but I hadn't come up with that plan. I just knew that standing outside the shop in the shopping mall was not the place. This was a special question, it was a special message, and we had to go somewhere special for it. So we, we went up to the Kangaroo Ground Fire Tower and uh, sat, on the, sat on the hillside there and gazed out at, gazed out at the countryside, and, and that was the place. But a special message needs to somehow come through a special messenger. And that would be, I guess, the best ex explanation that I can think of for the presence of Gabriel in the lives, suddenly, of Zechariah and, and Mary. There was a special message for them. And for that special message, there had to be a special messenger. And God chose perhaps the, the best-known angel in all of Scripture, Gabriel. And we'll learn a little bit more later about the significance of that. He chose Gabriel to be the messenger. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, Gabriel had had some pretty spectacular messages to bring to God's people before. They would have to deal with the, the rise and the fall of nations. And now he appears to Zechariah and, and to Mary. He was a special messenger because he had a very, very special message. When we get a word from God we need to recognize that it is a very, very special thing indeed. A word from God is a special thing. Now, in the opening chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 1, we have these two stories, and there are certain similarities between them, Zechariah and Mary. Both of them have a visit from the angel Gabriel. Both of them are receiving a word from God. Both of them will hear a word from God that has to, has to do with conceiving a child. Of course, um, the miracle for, uh, for Zechariah and Elizabeth is that they are elderly, and they certainly weren't expecting this. The miracle for, for Mary is, well, it is, it is quite something. There is no father um, in order to conceive a child. That is really going to take, take a miracle. And yet, 
many have, as they've looked at the contrast of these two stories, puzzled over the fact that both of them had a question for Gabriel, and yet Zechariah seems to get a little bit of a raw deal here. You know, I'm not sure if you remember the stories, but after Gabriel informs Zechariah that, that you and Elizabeth are going to have a, have a child, he, he asks the question, you know, or ha, 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 thinking about their age, how can I be sure of this? I mean, we're, we're, we're quite old. And to, to that, he receives from Gabriel a rebuke and a sign, actually, which I think is, you know, losing his, his voice for nine months, I think actually is more of a sign than it is some sort of punishment. But now Mary also has a question. Gabriel appears to, to her, and her question is, well, how can this be, seeing as I'm, I'm a virgin? But instead of Mary receiving a rebuke, she actually receives a reassurance. It's okay, got this covered. The, the Spirit of God, the Holy One, is going to, is going to, to literally, the, the wording in the Greek is to overshadow you is to come upon you and overshadow you. It's very much like envelop you in a cloud. Uh, the, the sense here is, uh, don't worry about this. You're worried about how, how you and, and normally, humanly speaking, a male are going to come together co- to conceive a child. And the message from Gabriel is quite simply, it's all right. God's going to overshadow you. You aren't important in the matter of the conception. Now, you are important, in terms of mothering the Son of God. (laughs) But when it comes to the conception, don't worry. God's going to overshadow you. You're not even in that picture, as it were, because this is going to be a miracle from God. And it's a wonderful reassurance. But why? Why the difference? Why does Zechariah's question receive a rebuke? And why does Mary's question receive this, this lovely, gentle reassurance as it as it appears to to be it seems doesn't it at least on the surface a little bit impartial but i wonder if we can understand this way mary's question on the one hand is is really about the practicalities well how will this be because you know obviously i'm a virgin i have no husband practically speaking this is this is impossible what how is this going to work the details And perhaps a reasonable question. Zachariah's question is framed just a little bit differently. His question is, how can I be sure about this? It seems to go just beyond, it it dips just beyond the acceptable into the unacceptable realm of disbelief. Here, Zachariah is questioning the veracity of the message that he's just received. Is this true or not? How can I actually be sure? Yes, he's concerned about the practicalities, the details as well. He and Elizabeth are, are old, really. Humanly speaking, they probably see that they're, they're, they're past that time where they could normally expect to conceive a child. But his question, as I say, dips just below the reasonable request for more information and details to that realm in which he's now really bringing into question the truth of the declaration or the message that has just been been given. One of the things that most of us as kids, don't we, become masters of is guessing what's under the tree. And uh, we, we have years to study this, years to actually map it out. Um, I, I recall on one occasion as we you know, did the, the normal Hunt family tradition and packed the car full of our gifts for the rest of the extended family, drove off to um, Uncle Bill's and Auntie Marion's place, and, uh, and there we unloaded the presents and slowly under the tree. And of course, you know, as a kid, you take note of this. It just fills up. It was probably pretty ridiculous, actually, <laughs> thinking back to it, but, but the whole of the base of the tree is just filled with these colorful presents. And then finally comes that moment on Christmas Day where, you know, somebody is handing them out and, and uh, usually they were, uh, one of the adults would do it because they could get the names right, nothing worse than, than, than Billy opening Betty's present or something like that. And so the presents would be handed out and, and perhaps 
As would often happen, one of your siblings actually got the first gift from under the tree. And it was a ripper. I mean, sometimes, you know, aunts and uncles, sometimes they can land it, sometimes they don't. But, but all of a sudden, you know, one of your brothers or your sisters is opening a present and it is amazing. You go, oh, I wish I had that. But you study the wrapping paper. And you know that that particular side of the family is using that roll of wrapping paper this Christmas. So you know what? If there's another one under there that sort of has the same wrapping paper, you can well expect that it's also going to be a ripper of a present. And nine times out of ten, that math worked and, and it didn't disappoint. Out would come another one from that same part of the family, and you're kind of thinking, whoa, if Gav got that, imagine what's in store for me. And you would anticipate something good because of the way that, that it was wrapped. Simply put, special message comes through a special messenger. Mary recognized the wrapping, and Zechariah didn't. Mary recognized that, that she was in the presence of Gabriel. Gabriel! An angel! Like a special messenger. <laughs> I can believe the message that he brings to me. The details have me a little bit baffled. But the message itself, the essence of it, its veracity, the truth of it, I can believe that. Zechariah just for that split second, was puzzling. And maybe there were many things running through his mind, his duties as a priest, whatever it might be. But in that moment, he didn't see the wrapping. It's not a big deal. God is still very gentle with him. And, and to be quite honest, I'm thankful for his question because we, we have an amazing little insight here. Zechariah didn't quite recognize the wrapping. He didn't realize that when a... When Gabriel comes to speak from God, you can trust it. You don't have to ask how you can be sure. You don't, really. This is Gabriel. But he does, and I'm thankful that he does, in one sense, because the answer has helped, helped us to understand something about God. Gabriel realizes that Zachariah needs a bit of a nudge and a bit of a prompt. He's going to need some help with, with this. He needs to understand that if a special messenger appears, then it is going to actually be a a special message. When God speaks, when the word of God comes to us, we need to trust that it is going to be special. In fairness to Zechariah, can't we sometimes miss that as well? Aren't we sometimes guilty? of wondering on a given Sunday if it's, if it's busy enough or we're just really, really tired or whatever it might be. Doesn't the question, if you're not the pastor of the church, run through your mind, oh, I wonder if God would just want us to stay at home today. He's got nothing particularly special in store for us at church. Does that question ever run through your mind? It's a little survey I've always been wanting to do. But (laughs) can we arrive on a Sunday morning or night? Can we arrive here knowing that somebody is going to open the word of God and put our trust a little bit too much in the preacher and forget that this book is an amazing book? Uh, Think about the presenter, but forget the authorship. Think about who it is that's going to be speaking today and you know, do, does their style particularly appeal to me or not? Hey, I did doctoral subjects in homiletics. I love studying preaching. I have, um, I have listened to, to most of the big name speakers that, that you might find on a podcast at some time or another, studying the techniques and looking at how it goes. And uh, you know what? I know that there are some who just instantly appeal to me and some who don't. I know that there are some who can grab my attention and some that can put me to sleep. I know that there are some who every time I expect and anticipate that I'm going to hear from God and some that, uh, oh, harm, I, I, I don't. And then what am I doing at that very moment? I'm showing that my faith is in a man, 
not the author of God's word. What do I need to do? I've got to come back and I've got to remember the authorship and I've got to remember that God uses donkeys. I've got to remember, hey, he does it with me every week. So I've got to remember that this thing is much bigger than a person. But we can be guilty sometimes of of forgetting that the word of God is a very, very special thing. And we should anticipate that when the word of God speaks to us, Things are going to change. Things are going to happen. Somehow my heart and my mind can be touched. And if I will allow it, transformation is inevitable. Because that's what the Word of God does. When God speaks, He brings things to life. He simply says, let it be. And it is. It's pretty powerful stuff. And it's because of its authorship. It's because the author of heaven says, I authorize it. And it is so. Zechariah needed to be reminded of this. And so in this wonderful verse, verse 19, here's here's how it unfolds. And I do love this. Verse 19, understanding Zechariah needs a prompt. He says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Wow. What a reminder. I can imagine Zechariah just, oh yeah, I'm sorry, my bad, I forgot. (laughs) Gabriel, you know, wow, I am Gabriel. I stand In the presence of God. And we can quickly overlook that. We can can miss the importance of that. Um, Gabriel has access to the heavenlies. He, He stands... In the presence of God. He's not just present with God. He is in the presence of God. He can see God. And he is seen by God. And that, by the way, is what we are made for. We don't experience experience it in its fullness, this side of heaven. But it is what we are made for. If you were to ask me, Stuart, well, what are we going to do for the rest of our lives in heaven... I would say, well, you are going to see God and be seen by God forever. That's it. That's it. You are going to see his glory and you are going to be glorified. You are going to see God. You don't need ice cream on top of that. Seriously, that's it. For the rest of your days, you will see God. There is no cherry to top that off. And you will be seen by God. That's Gabriel's experience. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. When else has this happened? What other human being has done that? That hasn't happened since way back to when the world was perfect. I mean, not even Moses. Saw God, yes, he spoke to God as a man speaks to another man face to face, but that's in what we call an anthropomorphism in theology. It means using a a human characteristic to describe a theological truth. But he didn't literally see the face of God because he then goes on to talk about the fact that, can I see your glory? Uh, Yeah, but it'll kill you. Why don't you just see the back of me? And so, so we know that not even Moses saw the face of God, but we will. Well, actually, he did at the transfiguration. He finally got his wish. (laughs) But to see God and to be seen by God, that hasn't happened since the world was perfect and it won't happen again until the world is redeemed and perfected once more. So this is not a usual occurrence. And Gabriel says to Zechariah, I am Gabriel. 
I stand in the presence of, of God. Not just present with God, in his presence. Bron and I went shopping the other day. Friday was our, was our day off. And because things are just really, really busy, we're keeping each other accountable for not doing any work. I think she slipped in one text message, which is work-related. There was another one I'm not supposed to know about. And I tried to slip in a call, but I made the mistake of using the, the car speaker and got sprung. But apart from that, pretty much it was a day off without any work interruptions. We, we just enjoyed ourselves. Nothing, nothing too amazing. We um, went, into the, went into the city, met somebody for lunch, went back out to Westfield for a little bit of shopping, and then finally ended up at a, at a cafe, and we're just, just chatting, nothing, nothing work-related, just chatting about things. And, and then, so I had been present with Bron all day. I had, you know, seen Bron all day. But suddenly at the cafe, she's gazing off somewhere else, and I looked into her eyes, those beautiful brown eyes, and suddenly I'd been present with her all day, but I was in her presence. Suddenly, I had seen her all day, but now I was seeing her. You know those moments? Gabriel was in the presence of God. Not just present, in God's presence. And he didn't just see God. He was seeing God intimately, looking through the window of of God into his very being. And with that as the basis for his authority, he says, I have been sent to speak to you. He's an important and a very, very special messenger. And he had a very special message. A word from God, it's a very, very special thing. When God speaks, we are drawn intimately into his presence. It's a very special thing. And then the second thing we know about a message from God, a word from God, is through the final reassurance that Gabriel gives to Zechariah and Mary. He reassures both of them, but he finishes off with Zechariah in verse 20 by saying this, I have come to you with this message to speak to you, to tell you this good news, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words. But then this is what he says about a word from God, which will come true at their appointed time. Whether Zechariah believes it or not, it will come true at the appointed time. This is like a word from God is, is like a cruise missile. It's inevitable. It will come true. It will hit its target. And at its appointed time, everything that it has been designated to do will be affected. The word of God is like that. There's this final reassurance to Gabriel. At the appointed time, this is actually going to happen. No options, no negotiation, no discussion. Needed. Why? Because where it comes from. This has been authorized by God. God has spoken. Let it be. And it will. You can be absolutely sure of that. Um, with Mary, there is a similar reassurance as well. Kind of a cruise missile reassurance. To, to Mary, Gabriel says, says this in, in verse 37. No word from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail. To Zechariah, it will be at the appointed time. To Mary, no word from God will ever fail. It just, it just can't. It won't. It doesn't. 
It comes from God. It will be. It is. It's the surest thing that you could possibly believe in. No word from God can ever fail. Well, we have, we have a book filled with promises here. Um, if you just think about the prophetic nature of it, it's, it's, a remarkable, it's a remarkable book. Thousands of prophecies. They've all come through. Some mathematician put together the, the, um, uh, the, the probability of just, just a few of the various prophecies throughout Scripture which foretell certain events coming true. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. If you just even took a handful of the prophecies that had been foretold and eventuated, this book is absolutely remarkable. Just on the basis of that alone, you would believe that there is a supernatural authorship. Absolutely incredible. When God says something, it will be. It will be. It's absolutely assured. I think the problem is, again, just one of familiarity. We can walk into a Christian bookshop and we can get so many different versions. We can get different translations. We can get the NIV and the NLT and, and the RNIT and the TNIV and, 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 and so forth and so on. Uh, we can get stu- various study Bibles. We can, we can get just a plain study Bible. We can get a men's Bible study. We can get a women's Bible study. We can, we can get a child's Bible study book. We can, get, we can get just about anything we want. There are so many Bibles. How many do we have at home? Flick on our phone and we can choose the translation. Uh, we, can, we can read it in just about any language in the world, except that we can't speak any language in the world. But apart from that, it's there. It's accessible. We can learn it. The accessibility of God's Word somehow, sometimes I think can diminish how seriously we take it, and the fact that we need to understand that when this book speaks like a cruise missile, it will come to pass. It has that power. It has that power because there is an incredible authority behind it. Again and again, we've got to ask ourselves, have we become too familiar with the Word of God? Do we, do we ask ourselves, what is God saying? Or do we ask ourselves, what is man saying about what God is saying? Uh, do, we, do we plunge into this like a, like a deep, refreshing pool that, that is giving life? Or do we just skip over the surface? It's, it's a remarkable thing. And I hate to say it, but sometimes familiarity can breed contempt, can't it? And sometimes we can, we can miss out on the treasures that are, that are in store for us in God's Word. But we need, to, we need to remember that this is not to be taken lightly. We should believe it. We should believe it. And it's best to learn that lesson the first time. And many years ago, we were on board the Dulos, and we, um, uh, on one occasion, we were in a port in South Africa. Now, the director of the, the ship at that particular time, Francois Vosloo, he came from South Africa and, and he had a van which he was, he was taking, he was going to drive from one city to another. And he, he had the van, somebody who was borrowing it, delivered it to the port and, and uh, from, you know, it was just a red, you know, Volkswagen van, Caraval, nice, but it, it sort of didn't strike me as odd. And uh, France and I was standing there with the ship's, ship's captain, Ashley, on one occasion. And um, as, as I was walking by, he said, hey, Stuart, come, come, and, come and jump in. And uh, I kind of thought, I've sat in vans before. I don't know what's particularly important about this one. But he said, come and, come and jump in, jump in the driver's seat. So I jump up into the, into the driver's seat and I'm sitting there. And he says, what do you think? And I said, oh, well, it's nice. And then all of a sudden, a jolt of electricity ran through my body as Francois pressed a little security device that he had a couple of meters away. It's called a jolt seat. And to um, try and cut down on, these South Africans, you know all about this, to try and cut down on carjackings, um, you, can, you can have this installed into your car. It's a jolt seat. And, 
And, and basically, basically speaking, um, if, I, if I understand how this works, uh, you get stopped, somebody takes your car, you drive down the road, you press the button with much glee, ha ha! They get a jolt of electricity going through them, like they just get tasered, they hop out of the car, they come back and do bad things to you. <laughs> I think that's how it works. Um, on this occasion, though, um, I was sitting in the jolt seat, and, and it, it seriously was being, like, tasered in the nether regions. And, and I was just, Whoa! And so I, was, I was looked at Francois. Why would you do that to me? That's, that's nasty. And uh, I got out, and I was literally, literally shocked. Um, so do you think if Francois had said to me, as he and Ash picked themselves up off the ground laughing. Do you think if he had said to me, jump in again and we'll give it another shot, would I do it? No, no, and I didn't, no. Do you think Zechariah, do you think after the silent treatment, <laughs> being silenced for the nine plus nine months plus two weeks that, that it took for he and Elizabeth to give birth to a baby and to, and to name the baby. Do, do you think he might have learned his lesson? Absolutely. Absolutely. He wouldn't have wanted to necessarily go through, through that again. And I think likewise, when, when God's word speaks to us, we do well to understand that a word from God will not fail. It will not fail. You don't have to do or take that lesson again. You know, I remember that time God spoke to me. Wow, and, and, and look, what, look what happened. I can, I, can, I can go back and I can say that is an answered prayer. Yes. You don't want to have to learn that lesson over again. You don't want to have to, to learn how valuable Scripture is again. You don't want to have to learn why it is that Jesus never seems to encourage and never seems to validate doubt or unbelief. He just doesn't. You can sit in your doubt and you can sit in your unbelief and you can feel very cozy there, but you will not have any affirmation from heaven. The thing that heaven applauds most is faith. And those periods of doubt and those periods of unbelief, those periods in our life where we go through those, the dark night of the soul and where we're wandering alone, there is no applause for that. It's a very lonely and a very troublesome place to be. Do it once and don't ever do it again. And if you're in that place, just turn your eyes back to Jesus now and get out of it. Wake up. Because that is not a good place to be. When God speaks, a word from God is a very, very special thing. And a word of God will not fail. John, in his gospel, has a slightly different birth narrative. Very simply... He says, in a very, very profound way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. <laughs> How's the irony of that? Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. The Word, 
of God is a special thing. And then John goes on <laughs> very quickly in chapter 1, moving from the birth narrative per se to the purpose of Christ. And he goes on to say that the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his very own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The word of God will never fail. We celebrate that by remembering uh, two elements. The bread which can remind us the word became flesh. And the wine that can remind us that he bore our sins upon the cross and gave us the right to become children of God. The word of God never disappoints. He never fails. We're going to take communion in just a moment. And if you're new to EBC, the way we do it is we have a number of people just stationed around the place and you can go to any one of those and, and take the bread and take the cup. Go back to your seat. Take your time. We've got time. The band are going to be playing in the background and we want you to think about the word who became flesh. We want you to, to also think about the fact that in taking our sins upon himself, he has now given us the right to become children of God. And then if you, if you um, eat the bread but keep the cup, we'll actually drink together and in so doing we'll express the unity that we have um, as the body of Christ. Let's, let's pray. This Christmas season, Heavenly Father, we want to remember the most wonderful gift, the gift of your Son, Jesus. I want to thank you that you have spoken. A word from God is a special thing. The Word. The Son of God will never fail us. Thank you. As we're thinking about a baby in a manger, it feels a little odd to hold symbols of bread and wine, symbols of a horrific death. But a death that you asked your son to enter into so that the sin of all mankind would be taken upon him. As we contemplate these symbols, Lord, we want to thank you once more for your broken body and your shed blood.